to start off with electricity and magnetism to understand that that is a uh, fundamental force in nature and it's uh, one of the interactions that occurs with all matter and the thing is that it is very potent and can interact with most of the things that are inside living people and the fact is it reacts most strongly with electrons that we find in all chemicals and that are present in DNA and I'm going to emphasize that because that is the root of a lot of the difficulties that people have found on exposure to EMF. Now, the thing is that these interactions are not considered by people who set the safety standards. Safety standards are set by physicists and engineers largely and almost no biologists. So they overlook the biological reactions. And these are the ones that are most potentially dangerous to people. And the focus on temperature sets a standard in terms of heating up the tissue. And that is not a sufficiently uh, rigorous standard for uh, safety. They are not, these standards are not protected. The next slide actually shows you all of the EMF ranges that exist. We are dealing primarily with the middle part, which is the, the microwave. It's sort of a third of the way up the slide, and it relates to uh, microwave and cell phone, Wi-Fi, all those things that are in the radio frequency range. We are most accustomed to the power frequency range. The difference between these different ranges is the speed at which the uh, fields oscillate. And so the slower speeds, which are very fast anyway, uh, are on the very bottom. And then they go up to millions of times a second, which is uh, all the way up near the top. They get more dangerous as you go higher. And most people tend, tend to feel that there is no danger unless it heats up. But that is incorrect. And I keep on emphasizing that, and we'll come back to it. Even the very weakest one on this range, power frequency, has an effect. The next slide shows that if you suspend the fluorescent bulb underneath the power line, it will light up without an ele any electrical connection. The connection occurs just through the field. The field spreads from the power line to the fluorescent uh, electrodes that have a contact, and they light up the bulb. The next slide shows that that same radiation that comes from the power lines that can light the fluorescent bulb has been leaked to diseases that are fairly common and that are potentially lethal. There's leukemia in children, and there's Alzheimer's and a number of neurological diseases in, in people. There's also been a link with breast cancer in women. And this is also one of the consequences of exposure to relatively weak fields. Look at the levels that are there. These are three to four milligauss. They're five to eight milligauss. The safety standard that has been set on the basis of a thermal uh, criterion is a thousand milligauss in the United States. That's way off. A lot of things happen before you reach that level. The next slide shows that you get these dangers even before a child is born. Fetal exposure, that is while the child is developing inside the mother, you get exposure that can have consequences later on in life. The children that are born from these kinds of uh, exposures have been shown to get double the rate of asthma and double the rate of obesity in the United States. And the thing is that this is both are relatively recent. There's never been this kind of a development in the United States. Both obesity and, uh, and asthma have suddenly come up as very, very uh, frequent kinds of diseases in children. The next slide shows you a list of various biochemical reactions that have been studied to show you that many of the reactions are influenced at relatively low levels. You see something about eight milligauss, you see two to three milligauss, five milligauss. These are relatively low compared to the thousand milligauss, which is the lowest line on that slide. That's the actual safety standard set by uh, the standard say, uh, uh, body in the United States. The next slide is one that is probably most important in terms of trying to understand why, how one can protect oneself. The next slide talks about the fact that cells themselves tell us when there is danger around. They, just like the body, when we are in danger, we may uh, start breathing faster, our hearts will pump faster. The cell also has mechanisms that react when it senses danger. And this is called the cellular stress response. The cell starts to make stress proteins. And these stress proteins, there are about 20 of them, and they are indicative of a problem 
that the cell encounters and it has to do something about it. The next slide shows you a picture of uh, DNA. Now this is a molecule that it says it's about two meters long, but it's all curled up into little coils one after another. And this is the famous double helix that uh, you may have heard about. And that's the way it works. But sometimes the forces that come from the radiation are so strong that they actually pull the DNA apart. And the next slide shows that the EMF actually damages the DNA. And if you take pictures, you see little pieces come off. And this is also indicative of a very important part of the DNA exposure, that this can lead to danger and uh, damage that will show up later on. So it, uh, it's something that we will see in a subsequent slide. The next slide shows you that same uh, listing of various frequencies that exist in uh, electromagnetic fields. And it shows you that both in uh, both uh, heat shock proteins, HSP, and DNA breaks have been found in both, in the, in the whole range, in both the ionizing range and the non-ionizing range. That distinction between the two ranges has to do with the fact that ionizing range is considered dangerous by everybody. The non-ionizing radiation is not considered dangerous because they claim, the people who set the tennis claim, that it doesn't heat up the cell enough to cause damage and there's no other damage. But I've just showed you a slide with the damage. There is damage that's indicated in this and there's no question that there is damage that occurs in these lower regions. Now, the next slide tells you that the DNA damage that we're most afraid, afraid of is the damage that's related to cancer. Cancer has been reported in uh, exposure to this kind of radiation in many cases. There are many studies where this has been shown, and uh, this is an important part of why people think it should be uh, controlled. I'd like to, in the next slide, I'd like to show you some data. There are a whole lot of data points on there, and it's a somewhat complicated uh, study to describe, but I'll try my best to let you know because this is very, very important. This is a study that was done in Iceland where the homogene, the population is very homogeneous. That is, people are very closely related. So their genes are very closely related. And if there's a you know, funny gene or some damage to the sun, it shows up very easily. So that they've been doing a lot of genetic research. And this is one of the papers that they recently published, which takes, which tracks mutations, damage that occurs in the parents of 78 children. So you have the DNA of the 78 children and the mother and the father. This is a graph that shows you how the uh, mutations, which is the plot on the uh, that it's the quantity that's plotted, is related to the age of the father. Notice that as the father gets older, the, there are more mutations that occur. And this is largely because what happens is the as the father, the sperm are made in the father as the man lives. And the thing is, as he goes around and exposed to different fields, he can get this damage. And the mutation occurs, and when the sperm is made, the mutation is, is in the DNA and it's passed on to the child. However, there's no correlation with the DNA of the mother. And the reason is that the eggs in the mother are protected. They're in the ovary and they are not exposed in the same way. And therefore, there is no correlation with the mother. There's only correlation with the father. And that correlation shows that not only is there an increase in the mutations, but there's an increase in autism and in schizophrenia, both things that have been increasing in recent years and that people have been to wonder about what may be causing all this. And yet, anybody who's exposed to this thing is a uh, subject to the damage that can occur by just living. These people aren't exposed in any special way. They just go about their, their work and their life and just normal living has given them those kinds of mutations. The next slide summarizes the kinds of uh, data that I've been talking about and they've actually been able to get a mutation rate that occurs in normal exposures in a, uh, what I should say, a 21st century kind of environment, at least early 21st century because the environment keeps on changing. Now, uh, the next slide is labeled, do not be misled. I have just 
heard that people have been talking about the fact that when you put in more odors, which is the real subject of this talk, that there tends to be a lowering of the field. That is correct. The fact is that there are slight differences. Uh, you can decrease the uh, actual exposure uh, in, as a result of introducing more antennas, and you can get a better kind of coverage. In other words, the parts that, that are uh, not as e easily reached if you, uh, when you have fewer antennas. However, both levels of exposure, the, the difference in the level of exposure is not that great, that's number one. And number two, both levels of exposure are potentially dangerous. They have been shown to cause damage that is related to cancer. And here I will show you data that have been shown uh, in San Francisco before the advent of, of Wi-Fi. These are data that were collected from statistics that were kept by the uh, town. And if you look at the next slide, there's a picture of Super Tower, which broadcasts uh, FM and TV and UHF. And these are all the different radiations that have, been come off, that have come off that. And the next slide has data showing the relationship between this kind of radiation and the incidence of cancer in people who live different distances from this antenna. So if you look at the graph, you see that there is a decrease as the houses are further away from the uh, radiating antenna and the incidence of the cancer then goes down. However, if you look at three kilometers, three kilometers is about two miles, and that's sort of halfway down that, that curve, you still have a risk ratio that is about six, which means you've got six times more possibility of getting a cancer than if you live all the way out uh, at a far distance, let's say more than double and triple that distance. Uh, what that means is that at that level, you are still going to get exposed, but that's the level that is uh, set at a thousand times lower than the safety standard. So that the current safety standard in the United States is below that, and yet that's the level at which danger is quite, quite clear, and the risk of a cancer is, is quite significant. And in fact, what we're saying here is that these are data that were collected through 1988. Nowadays, the exposure is much higher, and I dare say that if one had data, we probably could get a much higher incidence. Now, the level of exposure that is desirable is shown in the next slide. It's an actual recommendation by the Bioinitiative uh, group, a group that was put together to try. These are scientists who've been involved in EMF research and have gone over the research, evaluated, and made recommendations. And you will see that the recommendations are quite a bit, at least a thousand times lower than the existing standards in the United States. So that we have a, a situation that is clearly out of line with what the science shows. Scientists have looked at these data and wondered how it is that the politicians, political scientists, people, have been able to come up with such a, uh, a misguided level of uh, statement of what's supported. And I think that the reason for that is that they have not looked at the biology. When you look at the biology, biology it's quite clear that there's a danger and that one should protect the disease. And scientists have gotten together and have made an appeal to the United Nations, to the World Health Organization. And that is the next uh, presentation is actually a, uh, an introduction to that appeal, which was sent out about a month ago. I'm here with disturbing news about our favorite gadgets cell phones, tablets, Wi-Fi, etc. Putting it bluntly, they are damaging the living cells in our bodies and killing many of us prematurely. I'm Dr. Martin Blank from the Department of Physiology and Cellular Biophysics at Columbia University. It is distressing for me and more than 160 colleagues who today are petitioning the United Nations requesting that they address this problem. We are scientists and engineers, and I'm here to tell you we have created something that is harming us, and it is getting out of control. Before Edison's light bulb, there was very little electromagnetic radiation in our environment. The levels today are very many times higher 
the natural background levels and are growing rapidly because of all the new devices that emit this radiation. An example that a lot of us have in our pockets right now is the cell phone. One study shows that as cell phone usage has spread widely, the incidence of fatal brain cancer in younger people has more than tripled. We are putting cellular antennas on residential buildings and on top of hospitals where people are trying to get well. Wireless utility meters and cell towers are blanketing our neighborhoods with radiation. It's particularly frightening that radiation from our telecommunication and power line technology is damaging the DNA in our cells. It is clear to many biologists that this can account for the rising cancer rates. Future generations, our children, are at risk. These biologists and scientists are not being heard on the committees that set safety standards. The biological facts are being ignored, and as a result, the safety limits are much too high. They are not protective. More protection will probably result from full disclosure of possible conflicts of interest between regulators and industry. Rising exposure to electromagnetic radiation is a global problem. The World Health Organization and international standard-setting bodies are not acting to protect the public's health and well-being. International exposure guidelines for electromagnetic fields must be strengthened to reflect the reality of their impact on our bodies, and in particular, on our DNA. Although we are still in the midst of a great technological transformation, the time to deal with the harmful biological and health effects is long overdue. We are really all part of a large biological experiment without our informed consent. To protect our children, ourselves, and our ecosystem, we must reduce exposure by establishing more protective guidelines. And so today, scientists from around the world are submitting an appeal to the United Nations, its member states, and the World Health Organization to provide leadership in dealing with this emerging public health crisis. The short answer is no. There's no such thing as safe. It's why radiation is dangerous and you try and distance yourself as best you can. You try and eliminate it. That's the easiest thing. Now they're going to send it through the air, through the, which means that everybody's going to get exposed to this kind of stuff. It's unbelievable. And the thing is, it should stop, it should actually go back. They shouldn't use it, it should replace many things by cable that they can because this thing has changed our, our, our way of life. There are some people who cannot live with this kind of exposure. The fact is that the cells respond to all of these. The DNA doesn't sense what the frequency is that's hitting it, but the electron will move. It will move, let's say, in one case this way, it will turn very fast, and it will respond. And the thing is that when it's moving very fast, more energy in there and it's easier to break. So if you go up in frequency, it's easier to break the DNA when you're in the microwave range. And that's one of the things about the uh, introduction of the ODOTs, for example. Uh, they will increase the coverage all over. If they, you get lower general coverage, slightly lower, but they, you'll get better coverage in different areas. But if you have an antenna here, you're over here, and there's a big tree in between, it doesn't matter, you know, you're going to get that, some of your reflection, you're not going to get the, the kind of signal from it. So there are local factors that determine. You may have a, a wall that's particularly, it's a concrete wall that's going to block the signal. You be out of luck. The fact is that there are local factors that are determining what's going to happen. You may get something who will reflect, will enhance your signal. Nobody knows. The engineers lay it out in the best way they can. People do it, the price people will come around and price the job, they will give you a cost for all different kinds of changes, and then the company decides what they're going to do. And when they do it, you're stuck with it. Your individual signal improvement is unpredictable. And in fact, it can go the other way. That's just the nature of the, the way they place these uh, antennas. focus on cancer is quite clear because that people know it's bad for you and the data are very strong showing that this thing comes as a result of exposure. Uh, but there are other things, there are a whole bunch of uh, psychological, you might call them, symptoms. 
irritability and an inability to sleep and all kinds of little uh, allergies, things like that. And they have been linked to exposure to such people are included, incredibly electrosensitive. They acting as agents of industry rather than as agents of the public. They should be setting standards that are based on what the potential harm is. But instead, they have, they've chosen a criterion that makes no biological sense. They have set these standards so that the uh, industry will have its way. It wants to build something with a certain uh, electrical device in it, and uh, they can do it. And they're not limited. The fact is that the scientists are looking at this and saying, how could they possibly do this? It's, the fact of the matter is the way things are going, industry is going to push as hard as it can, as long as it can. Somebody has to stop it. Uh, I'd say no, 